Okay, got the microphone set up. Of course, yell at me if you don't hear anything or if I've made some technical mistake. I'll just turn off this YouTube. All right. Okay, oh wow. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at the background. It seems I've inadvertently chosen some Christmas colors. That was not planned, so sorry about that. It's not Christmas yet, it's a little bit early. Although I do spend a lot of time in coffee shops and while there's nothing wrong with Christmas songs, I think six hours looped of jingle bells is a little bit much. So um, I don't know if anybody out there spends as much time at Starbucks as I do. It's getting pretty annoying. Uh, December can be a rough time to be working in public, but I'm gonna push through it. And also the stock market doesn't seem to wanna give up the Christmas rally either. So who knows, maybe me throwing on these colors in the background It'll inspire the S&P 500 to not ruin everybody's December. So if it does make some miraculous recovery here, you know who to thank. That one is my, my doing. All right, so welcome everybody. Hopefully that's working. Wait for a few more people to roll in here. Thank you very much for joining me. It's been a pretty rough week. Well, I guess it depends on what side of the trades you've been on, but it's been an interesting week to say, you know, at the very least. And sometimes it's a little bit tough to time these things. Of course, I wanna do the education. We're gonna talk about fading VIX spikes with some structured option trades. You can never really nail it on the day, but it does actually appear anyway. Like today's a pretty good day to take a look at these things because the VIX is back over 30. It's at 3160 now as I'm staring at it now. So good stuff. We're gonna have a lot to talk about. There is a lot to get to, so Here's the rundown, what I'm planning to go through. First section will be super quick. I'm just gonna go over some very brief data. Obviously, we wanna figure out why people wanna short the VIX in the first place, right? If it over 30, what does that mean? We're gonna check frequency, duration of VIX spikes, and then we're gonna get into all these trades. And of course, not all option trades are created equal. There are some ways that you can do very well for yourself trading options. There are other ways that you could blow up your account and really set yourself back several years in your retirement planning. So we are going to go over three of the, in my opinion, bad trades. I said best, worst, of course it's YouTube. You gotta be very succinct and a little bit flashy. I'm not sure if they're the actual best or worst, but in my opinion, we're gonna go over three bad ones, common ways to do it, but in my opinion, poor. And then of course, three better ways to do it. I'll give you that. And then if we have time, I'll actually go ahead and execute these trades in our our live stream account for everybody. Sometimes people are a little bit stressed out about trade executions. You don't need to be, you know, you don't have to nickel and dime it. You just get the price you get. But maybe if we have some time towards the end, I'll do that. And then of course the open Q and A. But without further ado, let's get into the intro. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I really do appreciate the support. So my name's Brent Osachoff. I'm a Canadian and I'm a former professional golfer. So you will hear the odd golf analogy slipped in there from time to time. I run, I love movies, diehard UFC fan, and I do love to travel, so you'll see this background change throughout the year. So just give me one minute here to do a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. If you do feel like you need a little more structure in your investing, I do also manage a private investing community with members from over 65 countries around the world. And it's all centered around both of our diversified portfolios. You can choose the one that best suits your personal level of risk tolerance. There's a daily email sent out every morning with a ton of very useful volatility metrics at the top, which you can learn more about each one of them and start applying them to your own trading. There's a daily article or video where I break down some of the most requested topics from members. And then most importantly, of course, in every email, every day, I state exactly what position each of my strategies will be in, along with all the allocation sizing and risk management that goes with them. I've made it easy to follow so you can get the same consistent performance the VTS community has enjoyed for over nine years now. No obligation, but if this is something you may be interested in, go to volatilitytradingstrategies.com, click the subscribe tab, and the monthly subscription does come with a free two-week trial so you can check it all out before committing. Thanks again for supporting the YouTube channel and spending a little bit of time with me here today. So let's get on with the show. Okay, so thank you everybody for joining me today on this little bit of a crash market day. I don't know if 
Everybody's got all their positions settled, so you can just sit back and watch the show. For me personally, last Friday was the day that moved me out of the aggressive positions and into more or less safety. So the last week has been, my portfolio has basically just been flat-ish for the last week. I've just been watching from the sidelines, basically. But uh, hopefully you're allocated correctly, and, you know, you're going to get some sleep over the weekend because this is shaping up to be one of those massive vol crush on Monday or who knows, something pretty ugly on Monday. We'll just have to wait and see. So I see my good buddy David Lincoln in the chat. Uh, I finally made it to one of these. Yeah, thanks. Um, I know we sometimes miss each other. You do your streams. I do mine, sort of. I try to make it to his. If anybody's interested, um, David Lincoln here has got a really good YouTube channel as well. I looked that up here. Um, you can go just search David Lincoln on YouTube. He does live streams way more frequently than I do. And former market maker, definitely an option specialist. So you want to make sure that you're subscribed to him as well. But uh, thanks everybody for showing up. Let's get right into it. We've got a lot to cover here. So the first thing that we have to sort of determine is why would we be talking about fading the VIX, right? The S&P 500, what is it down recently? Um, it's, it's not looking good, but it's not down a whole lot. So I would say that, I don't know, just to put numbers on it, let's say half the population out there is feeling like the stock market's going to continue lower, and maybe the other half thinks that it's going to bounce here. Maybe the buy the dip crowd will come in and buy the dip. So as far as the actual performance of the stock market, Hard to really say that everybody out there is looking at sort of the same thing. But when it comes to volatility, specifically the VIX, when it gets over 30, there is a fairly lopsided trade going on where most people are expecting it to decline. And the basic reason for that is it really doesn't happen very often. So these are the VIX spikes going back all the way to 1986. So I'm actually using the old VXO calculation which is the S&P 100 from 86 to 90, and then picking up on the actual S&P 500 VIX from 1990 onward. But you can see that 8.55% of trading days is what we're talking about here. So it's not actually that common. And maybe a better way to look at it, this is the VIX index back to 1990. And the level we're talking about is basically right there, right? Over 30, 8.5% of trading days is going to be spent there. But again, it's not actually that common. Come on, spreadsheet. This happens a lot. It's going to beach ball a little bit. It's not actually that common. And sometimes you can go years in between these VIX spikes. So when you see one, when we actually do see one of these where the VIX is, has one of these peaks, there's nothing saying that it couldn't continue higher, of course. But it is the time when everybody's looking for, hey, what should I do? Maybe it's going to drop back down. So... Just some quick data there. If you want to know the actual extended days and how long these typically last after it spikes into 30s, again, not very common. This is why it's a somewhat crowded trade. The mean reverting nature of the VIX index, or maybe more specifically the mode reverting nature. Here's the mean of the VIX. It's actually pretty close to 20. But as we know, this is the mode. Remember, the mode is the most frequently occurring number in a series of numbers. It's actually not uncommon at all for the VIX to spend a significant portion from the, say, 11 to 14 range. So while the mean is close to 20, the VIX does spend an awful lot of its time in the low teens. So maybe we could say that it's mean slash mode reverting. But anyway, people are looking to fade it because it's really not that common to stay very high for very long. You can see there's been a few periods here. Obviously, Black Monday pushed the old VXO up to 150 on a close, up to 172 on an intraday basis. So obviously that's not good. Let me show sure I'm on screen share. So yeah, up to 172, 150. That's going to actually take a little while to resolve itself. A couple of these other ones, of course, we can kind of ignore the financial crisis. Any trades that people structured to fade the VIX during that, probably they all stopped out and lost. And hopefully people didn't do any anything too crazy and reckless. But yeah, you can see we're looking at basically a handful of times where these VIX spikes lasted for longer than a month, right? These are trading days. So there have been that four of them that lasted two months or longer. There's been another one that lasted about a month and a half, but the majority of them, they do actually get faded. And that's why everybody on Twitter, 
everybody you see out there, hey, let's short the VIX, right? So there's a few ways to go about doing this. The first, let's go into the worst ways, first of all, because I think that I don't want to go ahead and say that they're the worst ways, but they're, they're common ways that I see people trying to fade the VIX. And I definitely want to go over in detail why they will probably not work out for the trader. So the first way, and I've actually got a tweet from just this past week. Let me close some of these down that I hope I blocked it out. I think I did. Um, that kind of sums this up. So this person said, VIX is a hilarious instrument, have $11,000 in a VIX put, 22 strike, December expiration. Bought it when VIX was 28, price now sits at 23. So it moved in the correct direction. Yet it's, you know, the, the VIX is down 20% from the purchase price, yet the puts are still worth the exact same. He says the moral of the story, don't buy VIX puts after hours or an IV spike. So th this is extremely common. You see the people say this all the time. So why don't we just get to the very first one? Let's talk about why buying straight up VIX puts is not a smart way to attack this problem. So first of all, we're going to create one here. So the VIX right now is at 3105. The front month VIX future is trading at 29. Remember the VIX options themselves are are not tracking the VIX index, the spot VIX, they're tracking the VIX future. Um, but so we're looking at about 30, 29 to 30. So let's do one. Let's say a trader thought 40, 46 days from now, it's gonna get back below 20, right? There's probably reason to believe that that's reasonably likely to occur. Here we've got the spike. Right before it spiked, it was in the teens. So I don't think it's that unreasonable to think that by this expiration date, that the VIX would somehow creep back down below 20. That seems to be a pretty logical uh, hypothesis for a trade, but there's a real problem with this. So this is what the VIX put looks like. Here's the today's price right there. Remember, it's the VIX future, front month VIX future. And if it goes down, this trader stands to make the profit, right? You're trying to fade the VIX. You think it's gonna mode revert and go back down and probably going to be right, historically speaking. But there's a problem you have a very large headwind here that people don't often consider. So while it is true that on a delta perspective, this is a delta negative trade, which means if the price goes down, this option's going to make some money. The first problem is that it is a theta negative trade. It's a long option. So every day that goes by, you're gonna be bleeding a little bit of capital. It's a problem, it's not a huge problem, there's 46 days on the cycle, but it is something, there is a negative bleed there. By far the largest problem is that this trade is Vega positive. Now what Vega means in the options world is all else being held constant, right? This is just a snapshot in time. It's not a forward prediction, but all things being held constant, this is what the option contract will do given a 1% change in volatility of the underline of the VIX basically. So you are Vega positive. You are long volatility on this position. Well, what's going to happen if the VIX goes from 29 and starts approaching 20 again? That Vega is going to be a massive headwind against this contract, right? You would be right on the direction. So on a Delta perspective, you got it right. You called it. It went from 30 to 20 within the next, say, you know, few weeks or a month. And you think you're going to make a bunch of money. But what ends up happening is this Theta is bleeding every single day and taking some of your profit. And this Vega could drop substantially because remember, we can just get a quick snapshot here. The, sorry, the VVIX, we're at 150. The VVIX is the vol of vol. So dropping a one point volatility is nothing. It could drop 40 points. What would happen to that trade, this VIX trade, if your Vega hits a 40 point headwind? right? And it, of course, it accelerates over time. So you're talking about a position where your Vega and your Theta could completely wipe out your correct Delta directional positioning. So the long put option itself, while it does seem like a good idea, and it is tempting for people, they see the VIX all the way up here and they think, well, clearly the thing to do is to buy a put option. How could it lose? The only way I could lose is if we get a financial crisis and it's still way up here a month and a half from now. Sounds logical. Problem is, 
massive Vega headwind. When you're buying that high implied volatility right from the start, this contract is insanely expensive. And if the VIX goes from 30 to 20 a month from now, this thing could still be trading at 85 cents. So that's the one problem. I understand that for the majority of option traders out there, when they see that, it's one of those things that perhaps you might want to do it yourself. Just take a one lot contract, just open it up in your software today. Uh, just do something that is just not going to impact your account whatsoever. Just take a one lot and just watch it develop over time. And you'll see just how frustrating that would be for somebody who doesn't understand Theta, but more importantly, Vega, that you're watching your trade do exactly what you wanted it to do and yet your profit is not coming. So, I mean, you might make a little, you might lose a little, but not a very good way to structure trades. The second way, I'm just gonna keep this highlighted here. Maybe we'll circle back to it later. The second way that I say is a poor way to go about doing this is another thing that I see often, which is somebody will say, well, yes, I understand Vega. I don't wanna buy that high implied volatility right from the start. Let's go ahead and be the smart trader. Let's sell a call option instead. I see this very often. So let's structure that. And what they will often say is, well, I'll sell it way out of the money. It's never gonna to get to that price. So we're gonna do a 40 strike call option on the VIX. And now this is what this thing looks like. So if you've been following my streams and you've been following my work, I suspect you know what I'm going to say about this position, but let me just go through it again. Because I want to remind people, the reason that I talk about never selling naked premium on volatility ETPs isn't necessarily because I'm making the claim that you will blow up your account or that you will lose all your money. For many people who do this, that is exactly what will happen. If you're selling naked premium on UVXY or VXX, yes, on a long time horizon, over a number of occurrences, yes, you're gonna blow up your account. But it's not necessarily that. That's just low level thinking. What you really wanna do when you're an option trader is look at efficiency. You wanna look at high probability outcomes and efficiency. You don't wanna look at the extremes too much. Yes, it's true, you could blow up completely, but let's say you don't. That's still not a reason to sell short premium. And if you ask any experienced trader in the options world who's actually been doing this, and importantly, who could actually prove a track record, not just tweets online, you will get an almost universal response that they just make it a hard rule, full stop, no exceptions. You don't sell naked premium on anything to do with volatility ETPs or certainly the VIX index and the VIX futures. They're all kind of lumped in there. You just don't do it full stop. And the reason is because it's not efficient. Yes, it can blow up, of course, but let's talk about the efficiency for a second. Here, this trader, let me lock this so it's not moving around. This trader is selling a 40 strike call on the VIX, hoping to bring in $330. The thing you have to understand about options trading is, this contract has 46 days to go on the expiration cycle, but options move moment to moment. That's that pink line right here. It doesn't take a move very big at all to see this person's potential profit of 330 be flipped and inverted, and now you're losing 330. That's a very short trip. I mean, you could, 10 minutes from now, this person, instead of making that 100% profit, now they've lost 100% of the value of this contract. But of course, it could get substantially worse. When the VIX is already at 30 and the market is already on edge, it's a very short trip from 30 to something in the 40s or even the 50s. And if you add a couple of days onto it, who knows how high it could go. If there's a single day spike on Monday, like a Black Monday, lest we forget, again, Black Monday. On Friday, the old VXO spiked to 30. There were probably people back then that were saying to themselves, okay, going into the weekend, I'm going to fade this. However, they were fading volatility back in 1987. But there were probably people thinking that. Well, they woke up Monday to a VIX that went to 172. So it's not like this couldn't happen. But you can see that even if it didn't go totally crazy, you could be two or three times down underwater in a matter of minutes or certainly a day. This is just not a very good way to structure a trade even if it didn't blow up your account. Let's say that you kept your allocation size small enough and it didn't blow up your account. 
you're still risking an awful lot of money to make a very little sum of money. If everything goes well for you, it's really not that much money when you're, when you're really looking at the grand scheme of things. It's not going to affect your bottom line. But boy, could it ever ruin your day, your month, five years. This is one of those things where I always have to insert a golf analogy as a former professional golfer. So my token golf analogy for the day is we have this saying. So golf tournaments happen. They're a four-day golf tournament, start Thursday and Sunday. We always say you can't, lose, you can't win a golf tournament on Thursday. It doesn't matter how well it goes on Thursday. You can't win the tournament on Thursday. But you can lose the tournament on Thursday very easily. If you go out there on the first round and you just you know, blow up your round and you're getting aggressive and you're firing at all the flags and you short side everything and give yourself these incredibly hard bunker shots and you're not getting up and down, you can lose the tournament on Thursday. In order to win it, you have to play well all four rounds and you have to be the last man standing on Sunday. Shorting volatility is sort of the same thing. You can't make your career, you can't make your retirement fund do something this year. You just can't. It doesn't matter how good you are. This year is not going to affect your bottom line as much as you think it is. But you can lose it this year. You can absolutely do something this year that affects your future. So again, just a little golf analogy there. Can't win it on Thursday. You can definitely lose it on Thursday. And the truth is, most people who play that tournament, it's typically 156 players in a tournament, most of them lose the tournament on Thursday. Most people who short volatility, they're going to lose the tournament quickly because they're going to do something that gets them into a tailspin. They're not going to know what to do. Imagine the VIX goes to 45 or 50. Are you then going to have the discipline to say, well, okay, I lost three times what I could potentially lose. Do you take your lumps or do you wait another day? What happens if it goes to here? Well, now you're losing a thousand percent. Now, even if you put five or 10% of your account at risk, you're potentially going to lose the entire account. This is something that you shouldn't do. So I will wrap this up because people have heard about my long, my short ball rants plenty in the past. But just remember, there's really only two things you can do if you're sh selling naked short premium. The first thing you can do is allocate so small that you're able to sleep at night and that you won't blow up your account even if something terrible happens. But if you do that, your profit is going to be on such a small amount of your capital that it's not going to affect your bottom line anyway. So there's no point in doing that. The goal of being a successful long-term investor is to get as much of your capital allocated as you possibly can in the safest way you possibly can. And long-term, that's what makes the best impact on your, the size of your retirement fund. Making or chasing large returns on tiny portions of your capital doesn't do anything anyway, even if you manage to thread that needle and never blow up. Doesn't do anything anyway. The second thing that you could do is if you do want to allocate a significant portion to risky trading, well, you're going to have to hedge it anyway. And hedging is very expensive. You're going to add all these risk layers, risk management layers, and you're going to end up with a trade that's no better profit-wise than being safe right from the start. So Either way you go about it, super low allocation size or adding layers of risk management. Again, it's about efficiency, not the blow up. The blow up's always lurking. And on a long-term time horizon, you will. Maybe you'll do it six times. You'll fade the VIX every time it hits 30. And from now until 2027, it works out great. And then in 2028, you blow up your account. It only has to happen once, of course, but doesn't matter. Don't do it. Full stop. Make it a hard rule, no matter what people say online, no matter who you follow on Twitter, hard rule, it is inefficient. Maybe you don't blow up your account, but it's still not efficient. So the third bad way to trade this, I'm going to actually save it till the end, and I'm not sure if we're going to have time because this might go a little bit. So let's jump into the good ways, the smart ways to structure these trades. The first one is going to be probably the most easy structure for people to work with. And this is called a long put vertical. Of course, we're trading the VIX, so we're talking about put verticals being a bullish trade. If you're trading equities or something, then of course that could be flipped. But what we're trying to do is fade the VIX. I'm going to adjust this to 2520. So this, this is what the trusty and obviously quite safe long put vertical looks like. Here's today's price. 
Let's lock that. This is what it looks like. So here we are now, and in 45 days, we're kind of hoping that we end up somewhere in this range. So where is the max profit? The break even is at 2250. Max profit is anything 20 or below. So right around 2250, this trade's going to be safe. And then of course anything below it is going to be a profit for us. So we just need the VIX to kind of do its thing and meander slowly down. If it happens quickly, great, but this is a pretty good trade and this will not get people into trouble. Now, I don't want to give people the impression that this is some beginner's trade. Trust me, there are a lot of very advanced option traders that also use this structure. So this isn't something that you graduate away from. This is good for everybody out there from beginners to experts. And of course, the reason is very simple. You are basically making, potentially, if you are correct on your assumption that the VIX will fade, remember this person's looking to make $330 risking their entire account. And of course, quick reminder, if you do go negative, those banks will come for your money. It's not like you just, this isn't like a game of Monopoly. When you run out of your money, everybody just you know puts the board away and stops playing that bank will come for the negative value in your account and they'll garnish your wages and there's all kinds of things. So yeah, this person's trying to make a little bit of money risking everything. This person can make the same profit, but they're not risking anything more than they're putting up, right? This is a trade that has a max loss of 240 and a max gain of 260. If you're right and the VIX fades, which it probably will, like we said, this doesn't last typically for longer than about five days, 10 days, sometimes, I mean, this is a, what is this, a 30-year time horizon, 35-year time horizon. There's only been a handful that would really get this trade into trouble. So it's solid, right? It's good. Doesn't mean it's going to be profitable. Who knows what's on the horizon? But you're not going to get into any trouble doing this. And it's very easy to structure risk management because I can just look at my account value. I can look at the trade, decide how much I want to put up for risk, and then it's done and I can just watch the trade develop. I don't have to worry about whether the VIX is going to go to 80 or 172 like it has in the past. So this is a pretty good trade. One thing I want to point out, this is just a little side tangent, but I know people in the comment section are going to say it. So here we go. A lot of people are going to say, well, why wouldn't you be on the sell side of volatility? And why wouldn't you sell a short call vertical instead? So let's go through this exercise quickly. Short call vertical, if you were to do a $5 one, looks like this, okay? So now, if the price stays where it is or goes down, you're gonna make your profit. But because of where you've chosen these strikes, you actually can potentially lose a lot more than you can make because it's an out of the money short call vertical. So the thing that people have to understand, and I know it's gonna be in the comment section, I haven't looked yet, but it's coming. These two trades are actually mathematically identical the short call vertical and the long put vertical, even though one side you could say is a long vol trade and one is a short vol trade, remember the options market is efficient. And even if individuals don't understand these things, trust me, that market does. It's a highly competitive place and they know that. So if you adjust the strikes to match the same risk profile of the long put vertical, what do we see? Well, that one's 270. Where's the vertical? Let's let these drift. Open both of them up. This was the long put vertical with a broke break even here. Okay. Max gain, max loss 235, max gain this. This is the exact same trade. It's mathematically identical. It's just a mirror of the other one. So the the idea, and I'm going over this because I've got a little bit of experience now, and I know the questions that are going to be coming in. I'm just going over it to just remind people that a long put vertical and a short call vertical, if you structure the risk reward to be equal for both of them, then they're literally mathematically identical trades. The only thing that you want to be aware of, and it might come into play, it doesn't matter in this case because the VIX index itself is a cash settled index. So there's no risk of assignment ever. Nobody can if they have a short contract, nobody can exercise it on you. It's a cash settled index. But you have to be aware that if you're doing it on stocks or ETFs, in the case of the long put vertical here, let's lock them both because they're literally identical. You can see it's just a mirror of both of them. You can see the short strike is actually the 20 put, which is very far away from the money right now. 
But in the case of the short call vertical, the short strike is a 20 call, which is actually deep in the money right now. Again, on the VIX, this does not matter. It's cash settled. But on normal instances, you might want to pay attention to that. And sometimes it is just better to default. Even though assignment risk is low, I've been trading a long time. It's a very rare event. But you might want to just keep an eye on that, that while these trades are identical, one of them is actually adding a little bit of additional risk, and that is on the short call vertical side, because quite oftentimes you are actually holding something that's in the money. But that is a good trade. The long put vertical is number one. If you want to default to something that will ac accomplish your goal and not get you into any trouble, this is the trade for you. Second trade we're going to go through is the old trusty iron condor. All right. Very cool sounding name, just a little side tangent here. The very first website, well, actually the first website I launched was back in 08, I believe, 09. It was called VIX Trader. I was just publishing my, you know, my basically trading account, my results. I wasn't making any money off it at that time. I was just keeping everything honest and posting. But the second website that I launched, I believe that one was 2010-ish, was called The Iron Condor. So just a trip down memory lane. I thought the name was cool. Friend of mine told me I should name my business that. So for about four or five years, I wasn't actually VTS. I was the iron condor. But anyway, here's the iron condor. Now I'm going to have to adjust these strikes. We're going to go short, 26, long, 30, short, what did I say? 19, long, 15. Okay. Here's the short iron condor. Again, I'm gonna lock this so I can talk about these prices. So this is the structure of the good old iron condor. Now, here's the hash line representing where we are today on the front month VIX future. We want it to go into this range. And of course, this is a very large range. So this is 28 to 17. So in this case, our iron condor is actually from 28 eight from here all the way to 17. This is the iron condor that we have built in this case. And again, it could expire anywhere. You have to keep that in mind. But in all likelihood, getting back down to these low levels might be tough because this is a VIX spike. I mean, this is the market is ugly, right? It doesn't happen often. So it's going to take a little while to resolve this. It's not likely to get back to the 15 or 16 range anytime soon. But again, it's probably going to be well below the 28 strike, unless this is going to be the big one, so to speak. So again, very good trade here. Can't get into any trouble. It's limited loss. You can only lose what you put up. And in this case, you're risking 225 to potentially make 175, anywhere in this range. Another great trade. I personally love iron condors, trade them a lot within our VTS options community. Side tangent, that will be coming back soon. I'll get to work on a some type of course that includes the spreadsheets that gives you all the VIX futures and all the volatility ETP data. I'm working on it. But anyway, the iron condor does play a pretty large role in any options trading that I do. The benefit here that I will point out, unlike the other trade that had the Vega headwind, this one actually has a Vega tailwind. You can see what might happen if we do a little volatility adjustment. Let's say the VIX does go from 30 back to 20. Well, volatility might drop 30 or 40 points, right? So watch what happens to the pink line if you drop this 40 points. If volatility does go down and this goes all the way to here, that's going to be beneficial for the iron condor. You're not fighting a headwind. You're actually getting your profit early. You might be able to close this thing out way before the expiration. It might only take a week or two if this thing vol crushes. That's the benefit of using the Greeks to your favor, right? You have to understand what is likely to happen if your trade thesis works out. If I'm right, and I'm not saying that this is my claim, I'm actually fairly neutral in my portfolio right now. You can see that not a whole lot is happening. I'm kind of neutral. But if it was my claim that it was going to go down, this would be a trade that actually provides me a tailwind in that case. So pretty solid trade here as well. I love iron condors. And again, good for beginners right up to all experts use them as well. They're great. The third one, 
I think everybody watching who knows me, you know what I'm going to say. What did I say? The 18 strike. I'm just trying to keep all the strikes different. It is called a butterfly, long butterfly. That's what this one looks like. So what have we used so far? We've used the 2520, the 26, 19, 15. We're using the 18, 22, 14 now. I'm trying to keep them all different in case we execute all three of these in the same account. You don't want to be buying and selling different contracts. So just trying to be a little careful there. But this is what the butterfly looks like. Again, awesome trade because you can't get into any trouble. Risk management's easy to scale. No problem at all. You know exactly what you stand to lose and make. And if we're right and it fades into the low 20s or the teens, this trade is going to start looking pretty good in a few weeks. So awesome here as well. Butterflies are a little bit different than the iron condor in the sense that the iron condor has flat profit covering the entire strike range. Whereas butterflies, while it is structurally quite similar, you can actually make a lot more than you can lose, right? So in this case, you can make 90 or you can lose 90, sorry. And you can make as much as 300 if you get one of those perfect expirations. Not likely, it might even be in this range here, but you can see you could easily double or triple your money with this trade, if you call it right, if it does actually fade down. So you've got three, in my opinion, three trades that you can really work these through any trade that you want. It doesn't have to be fading the VIX, it could be trading the SPY, it could be trading VXX, whatever it is, but all three of these I would highly recommend that you just make them part of your options toolbox because they're just going to come up over and over again. Whenever you see something, you think, well, I want to I want to play this. I think it's going to do that. Well, probably on your checklist of things, you're going to think vertical, condor, butterfly. The other thing that was really cool about the third one, the butterflies, while this does apply to iron condors as well, you can break the wings. All right, so if I moved this 26 to the 28, you can see what would happen. You're transferring a little bit of the risk from one side to the other. You can do that on condors as well, but I personally like to do it on butterflies better. So as an example, let's say there's a person out there watching this stream who thinks this is a pretty good trade. I think the VIX will go down, but they're a little bit worried that it might not. Maybe this event was actually very significant and they're a little worried that vol is going to remain sticky and a month from now, we could still be in the mid to high 20s. Well, in that case, you could actually break this wing. You could remove the 22 and put it at the 20. And now you've actually taken your trade to where the low side, you're going to lose 290. The high side, you can only lose 90. But in the middle, you can still get your range. And this is, I mean, it looks small, but this isn't a very small range. Fading the VIX here, you got to remember in the last week or so, it's going to, this pink line is going to be like slicing through here. You have to see it happen firsthand to, to do it. So maybe again, take a single lot contract and see how this plays out. But it'll be slicing actually pretty high there. So there is definitely potential to double your money, but certainly based on contract size, you could even go more aggressive. The odds of it getting to 14, not great. I mean, could it happen? Sure. Could the VIX get... I mean, the, the lowest it got here was 15, and it wasn't for very long. Could it get all the way to 14? Yeah, maybe. Um, since this is a limited loss trade, basically it's a bet, right? That's what options trading is. I don't like to use those words, but yeah, you're speculating. I would speculate money that it's not going to get to the mid-teens anytime soon. Um, but that's the trade if a person was worried on the high side. Well, what about if a person was actually worried that, well, you know what? It might crush and it might crush hard. Buy the dippers are going to come any minute now and you could break the other wing. So you could go the other way and now you've got a trade that still you're going to lose 90 bucks if you're wrong, but now you've got a trade that has a pretty large win rate there. Here's the price all the way here. If it fades anywhere below 21 by expiration, you're going to be in some type of profit range. So again, that's a broken wing butterfly going the other way. Very, very good trade. I like them because of the fact that you can make them either delta neutral, 
which was that original position, or you can break the wings and you can transfer risk from one side to the other, depending on whether you have a small directional bias. If you have a large directional bias, well, then you're just going to go a vertical. If you think, well, I'm going to draw a line in the sand and that's it. Well, then the vertical's the, the trade for you. If you have a slight directional bias, broken wing butterfly, move it up a little and make sure that both sides are going to lose something, but one side that you're more worried about will lose less than the other side that you're really not concerned about. Doesn't mean you can't be wrong, so don't go too aggressive with them. But point being is that uh, for partially directional trading, broken wing butterflies are, are really at the top of my list for, for things that I trade. VTS community knows that about VXX, UVXY trading. I use broken wing butterflies a lot for those things. Um, like I hinted earlier, you'll never see me selling naked calls on those products because you don't have to. It's inefficient. You'll make less money doing the calls on the long term than you will actually doing structured trades. But uh, yeah, broken wing butterflies are great. So the last thing, let me check the time. I do want to give everybody plenty of time for the Q&A. Let's go through this because you may not have seen it before. One of the other trades, I did two bad ones, right? The long put option has a massive Vega headwind. The short call option has way terrible risk management. So both of those are out. The third one that I was going to go over, it's not a terrible trade, but and it's not overly common, but it is something that you will see, and that is a long put calendar. So what a calendar spread is, is this. Now, the reason I want to go over this is because of how this is going to look on first glance. And I just want to go over what, what this can look like in the likely forward, forward scenario. So this is a long put calendar on the VIX index. And what you've got here is you are short the front month January contract and you're long the back month February contract. So this is a multi-month contract that you'll probably have to get increased permissions to be able to trade. It's, it's a limited loss trade, right? The loss is capped, but this looks just brilliant on first glance, doesn't it? I mean, it looks like a trade that, wow, I've got a massive profit range here and I'm really only putting up $33 to get this and I could potentially make in the hundreds, right? This looks great. The problem again is the same thing with the Greeks moving around. This is a snapshot in time looking at it right now. This is not what the trade's gonna look like if the VIX does actually get to 20. Remember, if the VIX gets to 20, you've got a VVIX that's going to collapse. It's at 153 now. So does that mean the market is still crashing? Yeah, down 132. We've got a VVIX at 150. If the VIX is at 20 a month from now, that VVIX is going to be around 110, 115. So you're, gonna, you're talking about a 40-point volatility drop. If we do that, watch what happens if you do a minus 40-point volatility drop to this trade. Well, now all of a sudden, of course, your loss is not going to change, right? It is a calendar spread, but now your profit range, it doesn't look nearly as good now, does it? You've got a pink line, a daily profit curve that has dropped substantially. You're going to be negative. You're fighting that Vega headwind all the way. And then, of course, because you're doing a multi-month and you're short the front and you're long the back, your max profit range is going to shrink substantially, depending on how bad vol crushes, because we've got to remember that a VVIX of 115 isn't actually normal either. Something around in the mid 80s, low 90s is more normal. But that's a 40 point drop in volatility. This is probably what your trade is going to look like, give or take, when that VIX crosses 20. So it's not the brilliant trade that people think it is. I know on first glance, everybody says, well, wow, I mean, how could this trade go wrong? Basically, I'm risking nothing and look at all that potential profit. No. Unfortunately, that's not the way the, the Vega works. This trade will start to look substantially worse over time, which is why what I always recommend, it's not a hard rule, but it is something to kind of put in your back pocket and just remember this, that with mid to high volatility, you want to be selling iron condors. And with low volatility, that's when buying those calendars can start to really pay off for you. So again, not a hard and fast rule. Depending on the time frame that's going by and how quickly things move around, long calendars aren't always long vega, but they behave certainly early on if you're not planning to hold it to expiration, which you shouldn't be. They're basically long vega trades, and you really don't want to be 
taking that headwind. Even though that's a better trade than the long put option, it's not much better because you are actually fighting that Vega headwind. So default to iron condors, mid to high volatility, default to put options. Maybe if it's an equity versus an ETF, it will be different. A lot of people like to buy long put verticals on the S&P 500, way down, way out of the money as a hedge. The reason that works so well, you don't always nail it, but it offers a little bit of a hedge there because you're doing it when the S&P 500 is marching higher and volatility is probably very low at that point. And so you're buying your put calendars at a low volatility level. They can work out quite well if that S&P you know, has a 5% pullback or something. But if you're doing it when the VIX is at 31, um, you, you might be walking into a, a little bit of a headwind there. So those are the three bad trades. I don't like to definitively say, do this, don't do that. I'm not that type of person. There's many ways to make money. But I do believe that long puts, short calls, both are out for different reasons. Long calls are definitely out for one very specific reason. And calendars are out as well. Verticals. Both are fine, long put, cal put verticals, short call verticals. Just understand that you're not actually short vol or long vol. You're buying both long and short Vega within the same contract. And as long as those strikes are fairly close together, those are identical trades. And then the short iron condor is an awesome one. You can just, anytime vol is mid to high, you can basically stuff the iron condor in, in most instances, instances and it's, you know, it's going to be a good trade. And then, of course, butterflies are awesome, especially broken wing. So you can overlay a little bit of bias without being fully directional, which is always good. I mean, how much conviction do we ever really have? Are we sure that the VIX is going to be in the teens a month from now? No. Am I fairly confident? Yes. So broken wing, move some but not all of the risk to one side, and then there's your trade. So hopefully I did a decent job at summarizing those, give you a few ideas. You don't have to do any of them, of course. Um, one thing that I might want to do is, I don't know if we're going to do all of these, are we? Um, but sometimes people get a little bit nervous on trade executions and whatnot. I always just tell people that, I mean, this is all happening with computers it's all pretty quick. You don't have to sit here all day long and get the trades. Sometimes the prices you see aren't the prices you're going to get filled. Don't stress out over that. The price you're getting, as long as you do a few best practices along the way, it's the best price you're going to get in the moment. And there's nothing more we can do as a trader than to just analyze a trade, create a hypothesis, structure it the best way we can that achieves our goal. And then you just get the price you get. I, so often I hear people say, well, you know, the bid ask spread is this, and I'm worried that I didn't get a good price. You did. You probably did, unless you're using market orders, which don't ever do that with options trading. But if I wanted to take a VIX trade here, if I wanted to do this, uh, this 2520 long vertical, it's really, I don't have to nickel and dime this thing. I'm going to get what I'm going to get. And uh, so there's the premium. It says mid 220, natural 225. How much do I want to put up here? So if I'm taking this trade, this is not within my actual portfolio, but I don't know, let's say, let's say I allow myself, I don't know, $5,000 or something for these VIX trades split three ways. Maybe this one would be about what? 1700 bucks. So the way that you would scale this is very simple. It's a long option. So if I'm going to bet $1,700, I'm just going to divide by roughly the 220 that it's going to cost me. And I'm looking at about 7.7 .7 contracts. So obviously can't trade partials, seven contracts, try for the mid at 220. I'll probably have to pay 225, but uh, this is what it'll look like. So you can see the price here. This doesn't seem accurate to me. <laughs> we're, let me see. We're, yeah, we're in a fast moving market right now. So Again, getting filled, this is not what you would probably want to do. When the VIX is up 18%, you know, this getting fill prices won't, won't be super easy, but uh, you don't have to nickel and dime. You just wait a few seconds. Okay, I'll pay a little bit more. I'll get the trade done. That's kind of the process that I go through. You just, you just saw it there where 
Yes, I did try for a price a little bit better than I was expecting to get because you never know. Maybe the market ticks the other way and you get it. I, you're often pleasantly surprised. You hear that little bell and you think, wow, I got a pretty good fill there. But probably you're going to have to do the five cent thing, wait 20 seconds, just get the thing done. It, it, it's really not a big deal. So let's go ahead and do an iron condor as well. What did I say? Um, I said the 26. We're going to sell the 26. This one, 26.30, an iron condor. Where's the 30 strike? And I said the 19.15. Again, I, I don't think this is something that I, those are probably not the strikes that I would be looking at. Um, but the, the only reason that I did these ones is so that I'm not overlapping anything, especially since you're, sometimes you're selling these contracts. So again, 1700, iron condors, you just look at the max loss for the trade. So if I just highlight this trade, how much I put at risk is right there, 220. So it's going to be the same number of contracts. It's going to be seven of these. And again, I'm going to try for a good price. Now I have four legs to worry about. But again, this is a computer. So I, you're not forcing anything through. It's going to happen or it's not going to happen based on the price in the moment. VIX up 18%. I would imagine it's going to be slightly difficult. So try for the mid. Iron condors might take a little longer because again, there's four legs. So what I would normally do is I would wait, I don't know, 20, 30 seconds, and then I'm going to get less premium there. You kind of start dropping it down and I got it. Uh, I was actually thinking I would probably drop it one more there, but I'm not in control of the market from moment to moment here. I have no idea what's going to happen on the next tick. So moral of the story, you don't have to nickel and dime your options trades. It, the, by far the most important aspect of options trading is creating the structure that matches your hypothesis covers your risk when you're wrong, because you're going to be wrong a lot, right? Hopefully you're right more than 50% of the time, but you're going to be wrong a lot if you're an option trader. You're, if any type of trader, you're going to be wrong a lot. I mean, this isn't Twitter, right? On Twitter, nobody's wrong ever. But in real trading, when you're actually managing capital, you're going to get a lot of trades where you just thought, oh, I didn't think that was going to happen. So structure them well, and then just get them done in the moment. Uh, trade execution is probably the easiest part of this process. You don't need to stress over it. Don't use market orders, especially on multi-leg contracts. Use limits like I did. Take the mid, maybe even go a little above the mid. Wait 20 seconds, drop it down. Wait 20, drop it down. You'll get your trade. Don't worry about it. Okay. That wasn't so bad. That was, what, 50 minutes? Rambled on for a while there. We can do the open Q&A now. Okay. Scrolling through the list here. I'm going to do something that I don't typically do. I'm going to look at the bottom of the chat first because typically people ask questions before I start rambling and going off on those rants. And then the questions later on are more relevant to what I just talked about. So let's see if anybody jumped in with something. Hmm. This one's probably interesting. So I have to take a wild guess here. But I think David's talking about the same thing that I mentioned in the stream, where he's probably like me. He probably spends hours. I spend like four or five hours a day answering emails from people. So um, are you referring to the fact that you're going to get bombarded by emails of people saying, you're a rookie trader. Why didn't you sell the call vertical instead of buy the long put vertical? Probably. I know my inbox today is going to tell, people are going to tell me I have no idea what I'm talking about. I can't believe you're a long ball trader. I'm always a short ball trader. I'm the smartest guy in the room. That I've heard that a thousand times. It's Unfortunately, the options world is a very competitive place. And even though those people that are going to email me later might not understand fully that it's a fairly efficiently priced market, I assure you that all of the PhDs and Harvard graduates and Wall Street hedge funds that are playing in these volatility spaces, they know that. So um, yes, hopefully I did save a couple of minutes for both of us here because it, it's a little bit frustrating. I actually have a video. I should have said that. Oh, um, it, got, it got to the point where I've answered that question so many times, I actually had to make a video on it. So if you go to my YouTube channel, oh, John Jones is in trouble again. 
Um, that's not my YouTube channel. As you know, I'm a massive UFC fan, so I'm oftentimes watching UFC content. If you go to my YouTube channel and you type in, well, I don't know, verticals, let's see if that works. Got some option stuff there. Uh, no, that's interesting. That didn't do it. Um, what is it called? Short call. Sorry. I'll, I'll know it when I see it because the, the screenshot, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, this is bad content here, but I definitely have a video. I, I know that screenshot's going to jump out at me. This one. Apologies for that. It says long put verticals versus short call verticals. Watch this 10 minute video. I go through actual examples, again, using math, showing you that yes, in fact, if you structure your trades to have the same risk reward profile, mathematically, the options world is very efficient and they are the same trade. So checking out the bottom of the chat here first, and then I'm going to fire up to the top and go through them. I should also mention really quickly here, all of this could have been done using VXX, UVXY as well. So if you're sitting in the chat going, I don't, I hate trading the VIX, you know, it's weird. It settles to the front contracts and it doesn't track the spot VIX. I get it. VIX options are, it, it, there's another layer there of understanding. And there may even be another layer of permissions at your broker. But all of these things can be done on VXX, UVXY as well. And in fact, the next time there's a 30 spike on the VIX, I'm just going to do this very same live stream, probably something quite similar. And next time I will focus on the vol ETPs as well, because they're, they're really the same thing. Uh, they, they're not the same thing. I shouldn't have said it that way. They are definitely different, but the trade structures work equally well and for all the right reasons on both of those underlying. Okay, here we go. Top of the stream, what are the risks to lose real money with your long vol strategies? Total portfolio solution, leverage total portfolio solution as with one half VIXY. Well, the risks are that um, I am a normal person who trades real capital. So losses happen quite regularly. Um, the Obviously, you want to make sure that losses are smaller than gains. Drawdowns are always contained. And anything that you do get wrong you've got a backup plan to make sure that it doesn't hurt that bad. So I think what you're getting at is today in my portfolio, we did actually move into our first little sliver of tail risk today. I'm just going to pull up today's email and I'm going to show you what I mean. I, I think that's what you're getting at. Apologies if I've totally misread your question. But uh, this is today's email. So let me go on the, where's the screen share? screen share. So today's email, we were fairly neutrally allocated all this week and nothing really happened in the portfolio. But today we actually dipped to our beta to the S&P. Just a reminder, beta is a measure of how much one instrument moves in relation to another. Every day I tell people how the portfolio is actually allocated. So today we have a beta to the S&P of minus 0 0.09. So basically neutral, but we actually did move into both gold in our, what you could consider our safe core strategy. And then we also moved into VIXM within the VB threshold. We got over 80% on the volatility barometer, which hasn't happened in a while. It was only 80.35, but I'm a quant trader and decimals matter. So we are actually long VIXM. That is the first level of what we would call tail risk hedging against the broad portfolio. There is another layer, which you're getting at here, the aggressive vol at one half VIXY hasn't gotten there yet. And tactical volatility, also one half VXX has not gotten there yet. So we're not fully allocated to long vol. We just took the VIXM. And remember the VIXM moves a little bit slower because it's the M4 to M7 VIX futures. It's not those front two that can move violently. So it's a slow moving product. What are the odds of losing money? Well, what do you think the odds are? We took a long volatility position when the VIX was over 30, and we know that most volatility spikes get faded. 
So if you're talking about just the straight up probabilities, and this is going to sound bad when I say it, but it is the truth, the probability is that that trade will lose money, right? I mean, four out of five times that position is going to lose money. The VIX is going to bounce or it's going to depress on Monday. The market's going to bounce and that VIXM trade is going to lose money. But it's not there because I'm predicting the, the very next time it's going to pay off. What I'm predicting is long term, if I always hold the VIXM every time the volatility barometer is over 80%, long term, that is a strategy that is going to pay off nicely for me. Monday, probably not statistically. Long term, absolutely, it's going to make me money. And that's why I do it. Because at some point, there's going to be a major crisis in the market. And I'm going to be getting into those positions with plenty of room to run. I mean, the, the S&P is, what is it, down 5%? I don't even know. But there's a long way down to where it could potentially go. That's what I'm betting on. So short answer sounds probably pretty bad. The odds are decent that trade that we are moving into today is going to lose money. But I don't care because I'm a long-term investor and I know for sure that as long as I allow my long vol to play out over many, many occurrences, long term, that's going to make me a lot of money. So that's why we're doing it, because the VB is over 80. That's really what it is. It's historically speaking, that is the time when I start dipping a toe into the tail risk end of the pool. Um, who knows what's going to happen? What is, what's going on now? It's kind of interesting doing a stream on a fast-moving day. s and is down 1.5 now. VIX is 33.45. It's, uh, it's going. VIX is, VIX is moving. Okay. Does it make sense to buy put spreads when we see the VIX above 150? Yeah. I think you asked that before. That was point number one. Long put verticals, excellent, excellent trade for everybody of all levels. Super great trade especially when you're talking about fading the VIX, because a vertical is basically drawing a line in the sand. It's not a delta neutral trade. It's a strongly delta negative trade. So you, you really do want to have a little bit higher level of conviction. And what we saw earlier with the data is more often than not, there is a reason to have that conviction. Because when the VIX goes over 30, while it might last a, you know, a week or two, which is in itself is actually quite rare, you can see a lot of these. You can't even see them. They're little blips. I wonder if I can help you out by adjusting this scale. Let's see how many times that they just went to 10 and then stopped, right? So you've, you've got a situation where quite often these are being faded. So there's reason to believe that. So that's why the put vertical is a pretty solid trade, specifically talking about volatility, because you can have a little bit higher conviction on them. But if you have lower conviction or no conviction, then iron condor is great. If you have some conviction, then the broken wing butterfly. But suspect you asked that question before I actually gave the full explanation. Would I make any money if I would sell strangles on random stocks in the NASDAQ 100? Has selling options always had an edge? It used to. Uh, it does not anymore. So this is, this is something that I often talk about with respect to efficiently priced options markets. This is something that a lot of people have difficulty understanding, but it is very true that back in the 90s and even the early 2000s maybe, there was a definitive advantage to being on the short ball side of things. That, that volatility risk premium, I don't know if you could ever really attribute it to blind trading used to work. I don't think it's that simple. But yes, there was a time when that would have worked. And the evidence that I always provide, some of you may find this interesting, but there actually is an iron condor index, right? And it's basically just selling, I believe it's five and 10 delta iron condors. Come on, beach ball spreadsheet. This thing always... Um, causes me problems when I'm on my live streams. But if we look at, I, I hope this is the right spreadsheet. If we look at the Iron Condor Index, this is just blind selling, I believe. I Don't quote me on this. It's been years since I've looked at the actual underlying, but I believe they're selling 30-day 
basically rolling iron condors of five or 10 delta. I, if I have that, maybe it's 30 delta. I don't really know. But the point is, this is blind churning of option premium. It's a very good proxy because a strangle, what your question was, is structurally almost identical to an iron condor. It's just unlimited loss. But, you know, a wide body strangle is basically an iron condor. So you can see, yeah, sure, there was definitely an edge in the early and mid 2000s. And even going back further than that, I don't know why this chart doesn't go back further, but I do have the data on one of my spreadsheets further. It was profitable for quite a number of years. But you can see that there's really no edge to selling volatility. It's been it's been 15 years since that's been the case. I actually did another live stream. You might be interested in that one specifically because I really went into a lot of detail. Why does it keep pulling up that? Um, I went into quite a bit of detail on why uh, this one, covered calls suck. <laughs> nice clickbait YouTube title, covered calls suck. But the, the basic gist in this live stream was that no, there is no edge to this type of thing anymore. I was showing that there's also put selling indexes that sometimes they go way out of the money. Sometimes they go at the money. There's buy right indexes. There's all these things. And all of them in the last 15 years have completely collapsed to the point where just holding the underlying is significantly better than they are. No, the blindly churning premium hasn't worked for years. It's been 10 to 15 years at least since that, since the options markets have been starting to price things more efficiently. So always, as a retail investor, always just assume that it's efficient. You're not going to find little arbitrage opportunities and little sort of, not to insult the question, I don't mean it that way, but low-hanging fruit type of things like, you know, oh, selling is always better than buying or... Um, Long put verticals are always better, or short call verticals are better than long put verticals. These are low hanging fruit type rules of thumb that have not applied for many, many years. Options is much harder than that. This is a very competitive market. So it's the same thing as when people say, well, you know, the VXX decays. Yeah, it sure does. We can see that on any chart that you pull up with the VXX, we know these things decay. There, there's, there's no doubt whatsoever that they are structured like insurance products and they decay. The UVXY, yeah, we know. Everybody knows this. As I always say, everybody and their dog knows the VXX and the UVXY decay. So why would there be an edge in buying put options on the VXX when literally every player in the volatility space already knows the decay factor? The answer is there isn't. If you were to just churn those positions, like some people on Twitter you'll see do, oh, it always goes down. You just short it and make a bunch of money. No, you don't. You really don't. And it's convenient that they don't have to show you a track record because that's not how it works. These are efficiently priced markets, give or take, from the retail trader perspective. No, there is no edge in selling premium over buying. There is no edge in buying decaying volatility products. There's no edge in any of this stuff. Options trading edge comes from you applying something above and beyond what the average player in the space knows. So it could be informational. Blind selling doesn't work, but if you know specific times where your probability increases by selling the premium, like for example, you're not going to sell, you're not going to buy a calendar today. You're going to sell the iron condor today. That's not much of an edge. I think a lot of people know that, but it's an edge. It's something. Taking the wrong trade structure, buying a put option today, not a good trade. Selling a call, not a good trade. Buying a broken wing butterfly, good trade. That's an edge, right? Long-term blind churning doesn't work, but you can certainly know more than your competitors. You can understand the VIX futures and the cycles and the expirations and when you should be short vol and when you shouldn't. And in my case today, when you should even dip a toe long vol. These are all edges that you have to apply above and beyond. If you're just doing a, hey, every 30 days I'm going to do this, or every five days I'm going to sell a call on UVXY and weekly cycles and I'm going to, money's fall from the sky, you're going to be very disappointed. Not you, you. I'm not speaking to you. That Everybody, you. 
there's going to be a lot of disappointment from that because it simply does not work. It sounds great on Twitter. Uh, believe me, getting followers on Twitter is almost as easy as just showing this chart, implying that you're a short ball trader, and then talking about easy profit. That's about how easy it is to get 20,000 followers on Twitter. Show this chart over and over, tell everybody VXX decays, and tell everybody you're a short ball trader and you're a millionaire. They will connect the dots for you. You don't have to show a track record. They will say, oh, wow, that's, that makes perfect sense. Look at this. This person's probably a mega millionaire. No, <laughs> they're not. That is not, there's zero profit to be made there. There's no edge in knowing the VXX decays. There's no edge in knowing that option volatility premium, the IV is higher than the HV. These are low hanging fruit. They're, they're all gone. All of those edges are gone and have been for, you know, 15 years. So rent over. Sorry if I went in a little hard there. Okay. It's hard to know when the questions were coming, how far into my... Some of these look like they were asked before I gave the presentation. And this is interesting. Applies today. I cannot trade VIXM because of limitations to retirement account. What can, else can be subbed for the VB threshold? So um, different volatility ETPs have different tax treatments and different structures. So you may encounter situations where you can trade one of them but can't trade another one. If that's the case, I would default to one half VXX or one half VIXY. See if you can get those in. If you can't do any of those, then you're going to be stuck with stock replacement. It's really the only way to get around it. Unless you want to do CFDs, which again, obviously in a retirement account, you're going to have limitations. So at that point, you're going to be looking at a VXX option. You're going to want to go long dated. So 105 sounds good to me. And you're just going to have to buy the long dated VXX. Now this is not efficient because of course you're buying into a headwind there. You're buying into a Vega headwind. So what you'd want to probably do is you want to do in the money long call verticals on the VXX. And you want to just make sure that the pricing and the allocation size is not putting your account at too much risk. It's going to be difficult not impossible, but difficult to scale it exactly. Oh, I closed that window, sorry. It's going to be difficult to scale it exactly. If I go in today, it's very easy for me to do. I can just take 20% of my capital and buy the VIXM. For you, you're going to have to structure a trade that somewhat mirrors what this is going to look like. So a straight up... Um, Sorry, wrong one there. Just a straight up long position. You're going to basically be looking to structure a trade that looks as close to that as you can. Come on, internet. In the money. I don't know. What are we looking at? Oh, why did that jump? Markets are moving around a lot. So I think Thinkorswim has a, a little, maybe all softwares. They have a little bit of difficulty keeping up. But... Um, you can't do it on uh, VX, VIXM. You have to do it on VXX. And you're going to be looking to do an in-the-money long call vertical with roughly, you can see here, a 72 delta. Decent. You could do that. And you're going to structure a trade that gives you exposure to long vol in a somewhat similar fashion, right? So you're going to check... You can calculate it exactly using deltas. That's not difficult to do. But on a live stream, it's a little bit hard to, to do that tutorial. But you can just look at the profit loss and you can say, well, okay, if, if the VXX gets here or something, I stand to make 50 bucks. And then you could kind of scale it over here. Well, 50 bucks, it's about here. So I would need actually more contracts of that VXX. Again, like, Deltas, you can calculate all this exactly, but this is a pretty decent size to match an underlying 100 shares. Wow, the VIX, VXX, these things are going crazy right now. That's why the numbers are jumping around. But yeah, unfortunately, we are subject to the regulations that your account is subject to. I'm not. I can trade the VIXM. If you are, try one half VXX, try one half VIXY. If you can't do either of those, options. If it's in a retirement account, like an IRA, you might have to default to stock replacement and options anyway, because oftentimes that is only thing that's available. 
you should be able to trade long only options. And even a vertical, I know for thinkorswim, it should still be considered the lowest level of options approval. I've, I've had people email me and say that the fact that it's a spread at their broker, I can't remember if it's Schwab or Fidelity, but I've heard of a broker saying, well, just the simple fact that it's a spread requires higher permissions. It shouldn't. It's a limited loss trade, but if it does, it does. I mean, what can you do? But yeah, it, you do the best you can with the account structure you have. And if you want a little bit more detail, you can always email me and we can kind of go through the numbers. I'm not a registered advisor. I can't give you personalized investment advice, but I can sort of give you a, you know, a ballpark estimate of what you're looking at. Best you can do. Today seems like a pretty decent day to get a, a little toe in the water of the long vol pool. So yeah, whatever exposure you're comfortable with. I, I just go with the recommendations. It's not a recommendation. That is literally what my capital is in. At the end of the day, 20% of my money is in VIXM. And like I said to the person earlier, there's a decent chance that's not going to work out. Decent chance. But long term, it will absolutely work out and make money for me. So this, I think I know what you're getting at here. Could you talk about the idea of too late to sell if a move goes too far too fast past our sell signal, such that loss mitigation would do less and risk reward supports waiting for VIX to come in? Of course, this will only apply to limited loss trades. If you have an unlimited loss trade on, there is no too late to sell type of thing. Like I said, with the selling a, don't do it, but selling a call on the VIX, if things spike on you, you're going to be confronted with that decision. Am I just going to accept I did something dumb and take the losses, or am I going to actually let this thing sit there? So that never applies to risky trades. But there are times when if you have something on, and it happens quite often with butterflies. You know what? Sorry. Something just occurred to me that I might actually be able to give you a reasonable email that I sent out recently. I'm going to have to figure out which one it was. See that one. And let's see that one. There are times with butterflies, for example, quite often actually. Here it is. Wow, I nailed that perfectly. So where's the screen share? So this is an email I sent out to a, a different community that is taking part in our UVXY broken wing butterfly strategy, where closing it, I called it the choose your own adventure because there's a point on this trade, I hope you can all see this, where the daily profit curve and the potential expiration price are the same. So based on where the trade is currently at, you might want to take your chances. But what you're getting at with your question is, are there times when you could be losing a substantial amount of money, it went way past, let's say it shocked way down and you're, you're, you find yourself negative and you didn't stop loss out. There are times when it is just best to say, well, okay, I'm down 80%, but I might as well let it roll because losing the final 20 is 20%. But if this thing fully reverses and actually goes even, or maybe even in profit range, you might find that you can make more than 20% by just keeping that trade on. So I think that's what you're getting at, that you're going to have to weigh how much further could I lose? How much more against me could this go? And is it worth just paying that money? One of the rules of thumb that I like to use, and it's not universal, but it might help you, is... Imagine you have fresh capital. You're not in that trade, but you're thinking of taking it. Would you? If you weren't in it, would you add that trade to your portfolio? Oftentimes when you're talking about trades that have lost so much, there's really not much further it can go. If you just flip it around and ask yourself, would I take this trade? Oftentimes the answer is yes, because the downside is the final little bit that you could lose. The upside is if you get a reversal, you could make a serious chunk of money there. So yes, absolutely. There are times on limited loss trades where sometimes just letting it go is the best risk reward play. Might sound like, hey, everybody online told me I'm always supposed to use my stops. That's just not true. There are times when not using the stop is actually a better risk reward profile than saying, hey, it's already passed it. Now I have to get out. Not always. 
Not always. If something surprises you and it shocks past your level where you're, you were supposed to get out, weigh it. Ask yourself, am I willing to risk the final little bit to make the potential of a reversal? Sometimes, yeah, the answer is yes. That doesn't mean you're a gambler. It just means that you're weighing the cost-benefit analysis. That's smart. So, but on limited loss, unlimited loss, of course, no. You, if you wake up and you got a gap up and it went way past where you thought it was going to go, you immediately, as fast as possible, get out of that trade. That's what you do if it's unlimited loss. Thank you for making the current point, saving. Okay. <clears throat> I think this is just a con confirmation that, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a more or less efficient thing. It's, I, I mean, if it wasn't, this would flip the entire world upside down. Could you imagine if there were little things here and there that were that easy, that actually counted as an edge? Like you could actually say, wow, I'm aware that, selling options is better than buying because the IV is better than the HV. Could you imagine if that worked? It would, it would flip everything up. If you imagine if knowing that the VXX has a decay factor of roughly 1.1% a week long-term, if that was an edge, if knowing that actually made you money, that would be brilliant, right? It's not a difficult thing to figure out. You just look at a chart and you say, wow, that thing goes down. Unfortunately, that's just not how it works. Everything, like you said, is there should be parity. If there isn't, there's something seriously wrong with the comprehensive players in the volatility space. There's something wrong with their basic information level, but that's not the case. Just take my word for it. The option traders you're competing against in that market are not dummies and they know how to price things accordingly. If it's mispriced, jump on it, but probably it's not mispriced. You have to apply your edge to make money. Are there any advantages of trading VIX options over VXX options, vice versa? Well, they're different, right? The, the thing about the VXX, this is not an edge. I don't want to make that whole rant about how there's no edge in knowing it decays and then say that there's an edge in knowing it decays. But <laughs> VIX options and VXX options are totally different right? They are completely different instruments because the VIX does have that mean mode reverting aspect to it, whereas virtually nothing else in the market does. So trading the VIX isn't always a matter of, oh yeah, it goes down. It, it has strong diminishing returns as it has that mean reversion. So if you, for example, have a period where volatility recovers on Monday and then it's stable for a month straight, well, you're going to have a period where the VIX goes below 20. But the person who structured a trade with a strike price around 20 or 18 might find themselves out of luck because it diminishing returns, it might not get there. But with the VXX, if we get strong decay, there's some momentum there and there's no floor. There's no ceiling, there's no floor. The VIX isn't quite like that. So it, treat it as an instrument by itself. If you understand it, great. I think that Generally speaking, probably there's more edge in understanding VIX options than there is in VXX options. I think that the amount of players in the VIX option space might make it a little more advantageous where if you did know what you're doing, you could maybe add a little bit of an edge, but just treat them as entirely different. Uh, the, the option structures will apply to all of them, but the strike selection, the duration, the, you know, the expiration dates, scaling, it, it's all going to be different. So a vertical butterfly iron condor works awesome on VXX as well, but you have to structure the, you know, all the aspects, all the variables differently. So treat them as, as just as different as SPY and VXX, as VIX options and VXX options, just as different, entirely different product. So again, talking about bid ask spreads, you're talking about a price that is being displayed to you as a bid ask spread based on the trading. In a normal market, something close to the mid should still be possible, right? And especially you're talking about a volatility ETP that has share creation and, you know, market makers. Now you wouldn't want to trade options. Does VIXM? I mean, I know some of them, some of them do. Um, 
with vol products, some of them do, some of them don't. So yeah, you've got options trading on VIXM, but look at the liquidity. Like why would you, why would you get into that? But a more general point, bid ask spreads are not something to be worried about. If you, as long as you're getting the best price you can get in the moment, it doesn't matter what your software is displaying to you. That's the price that you got. Did the trade make sense at that price or didn't it? That's kind of what you're asking, but I don't stress over this. The, the reason I filled those trades live is because people do stress over this, but I don't think it's worth worrying about. Some products have wider bid ask spreads. You would not want to trade market orders on anything that has a wide bid ask, but that doesn't mean you can't get something very close to the mid, even on things with lower liquidity, like an MVV, for example, or a, you know, whatever, some type of two times or three times leveraged ETF that might only have 100 million assets under management can still get something very close to the mid. And the trade itself still makes sense at that one or two pennies below the ideal mid. That's what you're worried about. Does the trade make sense within a band of fill prices? Almost always the answer is yes. I'd still, the, the trades that I executed, if I had to drop that iron condor five or even 10 cents more, still would have taken it. It's just, okay, the moment that I was sitting in front of my computer, I got a slightly worse price, but it is what it is. These are computers. I mean, it's not some person with paper, you know, trying to force something through. That, that is the price that the market was trading at when I did it. So I'm not suggesting you don't care at all. Give it a minute or two, but not worried about bid ask spreads too much. I select all ETFs and options to have adequate liquidity for most people's account size. I cannot speak on it if you're managing $100 million, but if you're just a regular human being like the rest of us with normal amounts of capital, everything that I trade at VTS is just fine. We trade no liquid, no illiquid options. We don't do that whole front running thing. Not to mention, I take my trades five hours after everybody in the community does. But um, yeah, I tend to track, oh, I think this is a follow up, sorry. First one is here. I just started following the VIXY. Are we looking at a volatility structure similar to the beginning of 2018? I tend to track FIBS, MAs, MACD, RSI on trading view, but I'm generally a spot trader. What indicators are best for following, following a deteriorating asset? So first of all, all the things you mentioned, I would encourage you not to apply those to a volatility ETP because volatility ETPs only derive their price based on the changing values of the VIX futures that they hold or the swaps that they hold. That is it. So if you want to do your technical analysis, which is fine if that's what you do, I would suggest you do your technical analysis on probably the S&P 500, to be honest. It might be the best proxy, and then everything kind of filters down from there, because volatility ETPs are derivatives of derivatives of derivatives. They're layers down. Why not just go you know, as close to the horse's mouth as you can, so to speak, and if you want to do your TA, I'm not a TA person, but if you do, I would suggest going a few levels above that and uh, and doing it there. Even on the VIX index itself, TA doesn't really make much sense because you're talking about something that is a derivative of something else. It's not even a tradable product. It's just a statistic of S&P 500 options. Why wouldn't you take your analysis to a more meaningful place? That would be my point there. But as far as best metrics go, I think there are several that you could several that you could look at. Um, I'm not sure if if um, I'm not sure what you're what you're comfortable with as far as the things that you understand. But just to give you an idea, most of my metrics that I use typically center around VIX futures options on the S&P, the cash VIX term structure, relationships between everything, measurements of implied to historical volatility, things like this. These are more direct relationships to what we're actually trying to do, which is structure a portfolio based on volatility levels. So I don't do any of the, the MACD on the S&P or the RSI levels. I'm not a contrarian. I'm not a, you know, what did you call it? You're a spot, 
something or other. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not that kind of trader. You know, are you swing? Are you day? Are you spot? I don't concern myself with that. I'm a volatility trader. I try to position my portfolio knowing that historically speaking, and the example I gave was a good one. Historically speaking, when my volatility barometer, which is largely based off VIX options, VIX futures, S&P options, implied and historical volatility, things like this, when that is over 80%, it is now beneficial to be long volatility. Not every time, probably most of the time it's going to fail. Probably Monday I'm going to wake up to the market being up and the uh, volatility is being down and that trade will unfortunately be what we call whipsawed. But long term, that is the play. So that's what I would do is you need to find metrics that make sense to you and your trading. And then, yeah, as long as you understand that, you're going to be good to go. I have a hard time figuring out why that would apply to the VIXY, but hey, if you've figured out a way and you can actually demonstrate real results, then go for it. I'm not going to say you're wrong. It's just, yeah. Maybe you didn't mean VIXY. VIXY is like a, it's an actual volatility ETP. Maybe you more meant the VIX complex in general. But even then, TA, no. Try to stay away if you can. I'm shorting vol. VIX above 155 happened five times since 2012, not including today. When it first started tracking and each time it lasted short. True. The only thing I would point out is the VIX itself is quite a horrible metric and it has a wide range of prices so or values. The fact that the, v, the VIX is at 150 now and it has settled recently in sort of the one... I mean, it's been... Let's look at this. Let's look at a longer term chart of the VIX. I'll show you what I mean. It's very inconsistent from from market crisis to market crisis, where you will get sometimes when it's in the it's in the eighties. I mean, long term, it's we've spent a significant portion with the VIX way way elevated. So trying to use an absolute level, like you mentioned, a number, you mentioned. 155. I agree with you that that number's high, but what you want to do is measure things in percentiles and relative to each other. If you're looking for absolute numbers, you can sometimes be way off because a different volatility environment, the spike in 2015, might have entirely different absolute values than the spike in 2018 or 2020. Absolute levels, totally different. What you want is to try to normalize everything so that the crash in the financial crisis looks somewhat similar on a relative basis as the crash in, in the pandemic. That's what you're really looking for. That's why I love volatility metrics, because it allows you to do that. An RSI or a MACD or all those things that people do, it might not. You might miss a lot, and maybe that's why TA people don't often post track records. I don't know if that's controversial to say, but I've not seen very many who do it. I see a lot of people who tweet a lot about it, but I've not actually seen people who um, who, who will back it up. So point being, you, you don't want to look at absolute values of anything, really. It's just, I mean, it's just a number. 155, it's just a number. It doesn't mean much. Relatively, like if you're talking about, I do X every time it's in the 90th percentile, well, that might be far more meaningful to you than saying 155, right? Same as the VIX. VIX gets to 17, I do X. That means nothing. VIX gets to 65th percentile, I do X. Now you're talking. Now you're doing something that will actually benefit you. So I would, um, I would avoid the trap of absolute values. Okay, off topic, no problem. What are your thoughts on 80% Qs and 20% TQQ as a long-term investment portfolio? Well, redundant is the first thing I would say because TQQ is a three times leveraged Q. So, I mean, you could just cut out the middleman there and you could just reduce your exposure to TQQ and not need the Qs, right? You just structure it in a way that you're comfortable and then there's no, no reason to double up on those positions. But what do I think of a 100% allocation to somewhere that appears to be a roughly 1.3 times the NASDAQ? I think that's a bad idea. Now, I'm not a registered advisor, so I can't give you personalized advice. 
but that portfolio would suffer drawdowns that I suspect will violate your level of risk tolerance. I don't know you. The one thing that I do know for doing this work and interacting with people for so many years, nearly everybody out there wildly overestimates their own risk tolerance until they're faced with that crisis. And then they realize, ah, they look at a long-term chart and they see a drawdown of 45 or 60% or 70%. And they think, well, that's fine. I can handle that because long-term it always recovers and it's fine. And then they get into a 60% drawdown and they realize, wow, that is, I can't watch my net worth plummet like this. I, I just can't do it, right? You realize you're faced with that realization that you misrepresented how much risk you can actually take on. So do I think that there are some people in the world that could do this? Well, actually, probably no. I was going to say, yeah, maybe there's some. I would say no. I mean, you got to remember that in the NASDAQ, in the dot-com bust, the NASDAQ itself dropped 78%. If you're going to mix in a partial allocation to triple leveraged NASDAQ, factoring in the fact that the next market crash, real crisis, we might have very few bullets left to save the economy. It might not look like the financial crisis where the S&P stopped at 56 down. It might not look like the pandemic where they saved everything and it, you know, in 2020, it stopped at 35%. It might look more like the dot-com at 78 or the Great Depression at 86 or pick your crisis that was worse than what the powers that be have been able to you know, massage with financial manipulation, that may not be available. So this portfolio, even looking at what has already happened in live trading over the last 20 years, I think that violates your risk tolerance. Given what could happen, I think it wildly violates your risk tolerance. So take that for what it's worth. I don't know you, but boy, that, I mean, you wouldn't catch me anywhere close to an allocation like that. I feel like I mean, there are times where this is my leveraged portfolio. There are times when even this makes people nervous. People who are following, we had a drawdown recently, right? Um, we got whipsawed a bunch of times and there was a drawdown of, uh, I think, 9% in this portfolio. People were nervous. They were emailing me, 9? 9%. People are nervous. You're talking about a portfolio that will wave goodbye to nine and approach 80. Um, yeah, no thanks. I've been going a long time. I hate when I do that, by the way. I really need to try to control these streams and just cut them short. But I did ramble on there, so I'm going to do one more question. Apologies for everybody who didn't get it answered, but let me give, give one more of these. I don't like the VVIX. I really don't. I barely use it. The only thing that honestly that I could tell you is maybe the VVIX has a use for is if you're trying to get somewhat of a inconsistent gauge at when the selling might be over, perhaps at that point you could start looking at the VVIX. And what you're really looking for if you if you are going to dip into this very imperfect metric that really isn't overly useful. What you're essentially looking for is sort of a flush out that is far outpacing the previous levels. So what you might see when you kind of get that green light that, oh, I see everything's kind of, the capitulation is here and now the market can slowly start to heal. You might see a VVIX flush down where it it really overshoots what the VIX was doing or what other you know, implied volatility measures are doing. If you really see that flush down, again, I wouldn't bet money on that because it's a very imperfect metric. But yeah, sometimes it gives a little bit of a, a clue. That coupled with extreme levels of put call ratios, those combined together might actually give you some reasonable idea of when the 
the buy the dip money might actually be starting to to come in. But understanding how what the metric means and what it looks like when it flushes down and it finalizes is one thing. But extra like putting money towards that bet, I still don't do that. I'm still looking at my comprehensive volatility barometer for the best possible reading that I can get. I wouldn't pick out something so imperfect like the VVIX and say, ah, the VVIX is telling me this. I'm going to allocate my portfolio that way. Not even close to being good enough for something like that. It's just if you're, you know, small pockets of your capital, if you wanted to use some type of VVIX contrarian strategy with 3% of your portfolio, that's what I would be looking for is, you know, obviously strong lower lows compared to other volatility might be an indication. I have a extreme put call VXX sort of long put vertical strategy that I, I work sometimes where if you ever see the, um, that's the overlay. Where's a normal trade? That's overlay. Here's a normal trade. Whenever I see my extreme put call ratio, like if this gets into the 93, 95 percentile range, which it might be actually today, at that point, I think it's a good risk reward profile to throw on a long put vertical on the VXX. That's sort of like a standalone strategy that sometimes just a straight up contrarian strategy with a very small amount of capital. But if put call ratios or if the VVIX, if these start approaching extreme levels and you see a flush down, yeah, R on a risk reward basis, that's when you could start structuring things like what we talked about before to kind of bring it all back is things like this, right? When you have a conviction and you use the VVIX as a, oh, there's the sign, looks like the market's going to go, that's an edge. You can go ahead and apply something that won't get you into trouble if you're completely wrong. And this is a trade for that. It's specifically designed for that. Same as, um, you know, the extreme put call ratios. Slap one of these on every time it's in the 95th percentile. Should be okay. I think, where, where is the uh, extreme put call ratio article that I did? I actually tracked it a little bit in here. And I showed that if you were to have done this for this, you know, two, three year period, there was only one trade that didn't make money. Uh, well, there was two there, but one of them is barely. But basically, yeah, the VXX, when you get that extreme put call ratio signal, it's a pretty high probability trade. So other than that, I wouldn't put too much stock in that old VVIX. I think it's uh, fairly imperfect and certainly wildly inconsistent from multiple year different periods. Not good enough to use for trade signals. All right, folks. Hope it was a good one. I think we had a decent amount of people watching. So as always, I hate asking, but if you gained any value at all by watching any of this, go ahead and give that a thumbs up for me. I will draw attention to the fact that I do have a clips channel now. I should have mentioned that at the beginning, to be honest, but I do have a clips channel. I left a link at the very top of the comment section. Subscribe to that if you like. It's just a you know small little clip every day that I'm going to be releasing. And um, let's do one final check of this market. This crazy market. So the S&P down 145. So, I mean, it's getting especially bad because a couple of these days, like this one here, as well as today, the futures were up. I mean, there was one day here, this was only down 1%, but the futures were up one point, not the futures, the S&P was up 1.9% during live trading hours, and it closed down minus 1.2 or something. So a massive average true range of something like 3% that day. And then today, again, the futures were up, not a lot, but I, I think I saw them up about 0 0.4, 0 0.5% this morning. And now it's just flushing down. So as far as the old long vol trade, it's notoriously difficult to manage. It usually loses money when you enter them. The hit rate or the win loss ratio is typically very low. But what we're trying to essentially do is every now and then you do get one. And when you get them on a run, you know, if you, if you enter them sort of early ish on and you get a real flush down, like a 20% drop, you can really make a high convex profit. And that's why we do those. So while I'm not a fan at all of the long vol trade, I am 
always heavy on the short ball or neutral side of things. Now looks like a pretty decent time where the risk reward starts to make sense. Actually, how many people are still here? Do you want to do one more thing while we're 97 people? Let's, uh, let's check the VIX futures. Let's check the old VIX futures. So minus, okay, here we go. Minus 4.6% contango for M1, M2 futures. So finally, got a lot of pages open here. Finally, we might actually break this streak. So let's go to the contango streak. It's, I haven't updated it in a few days. I think it's 217, maybe 216. 216 straight days of M1, M2 contango is about to be broken today. So here's all the streaks that we've been tracking since VIX Futures launched in 2004. It's looking promising that while it never dipped negative since January 27th, it does look like today might be the day. So uh, that'll be interesting. Obviously, the VIX, VX30 to VIX roll yield is massively negative right now, and it, it has been several times along the way. But interesting, we might lose the streak. Oh, it'll be so sad. I didn't show any of that, did I? Hey, at least it's two hours into the live stream. You can't can't hold it against me. It's been a while. So anyway, let's review that again really quick. 213. It's actually 216 is my guess. But um, here's all the streaks for anybody. You can just pause and come back and watch it. Since January 27th, it got to two once, but it, it never dipped negative. I'm feeling it. I think it's today. I think the market... Minus 1.42. Unless we see some miraculous recovery, I think we're going to see uh, our first day since January 27th of VIX futures backwardation. So take care, everybody. And I'll think up another topic soon, and we'll do another stream next week. Hopefully you all join me. Thanks for watching.